And, and thank you, Hector, for the uh, uh, introduction. So, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Su Ching Chen. I'm really happy to be here. This is my first time at the breakthrough discussion, so I'm very excited and look forward to the exciting uh, uh, discussions uh, ahead. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to discuss the 21 centimeter cosmology from the far side of the moon, as uh, Hector said. So, uh, this, the topic seems a little bit disjoint from the techno uh, signature topics, but hopefully, uh, throughout the talk, you'll uh, get to uh, realize the, the synergy with the, uh, with, with the techno signature search. Um, so I guess before I begin, I would like to mention that uh, South Af Africa actually hosts some of the most powerful radio observatories, including uh, Meerkat, uh, Hyrax, Hera, and uh, SKA that's coming online very soon. And they all have the 21 centimeter cosmology as one of the major science goals. So thank you, South Africa. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so let me maybe begin by defining what I mean by 21 centimeter cosmology. So 21 centimeter refers to a, a tra transition line of neutral hydrogen. So this is basically the ground, uh, ground state spin fleet uh, hyperfine transition of uh, 21 centimeter. Oh, sorry, of neutral hydrogen here, as you can see. And uh, it is actually a forbidden line. It's a hyperfine transition. And therefore, it means the uh, spontaneously, spontaneous transition uh, decay rate is very, very long, so of order 10 mi uh, million years. So this means that it will be in basically impossible for us to detect it uh, on Earth. Um, uh, in, in the labs during a human uh, life time scale. But luckily and importantly, that uh, universe is filled with neutral hydrogen. And uh, especially a very high ratio of uh, the hydrogen remain in the neutral form. And this uh, provides us a really important tracer of the uh, universe for allowing us to study cosmology. Uh, sorry. So uh, another introduction about cosmology. So this is actually we are, have a pretty, I think we have pretty good currently, a very good uh, and successful cosmological model with just six parameters describing the universe. Here is a history of the, uh, uh, the universe where we started with the hot big bang. Bang, and then the, very soon after, the universe underwent a very fast expansion called inflation, and then allowing the elements to cool down, and so for, for the proton and the electrons to recombine, and that now the cosmic microwave background radiation here, as you can see, uh, sorry, in the middle, sorry. Um, sorry, I guess pointing didn't work too well, but you, you can see the cosmic microwave background uh, radiation coming out from here, and then the and then the, not soon afterwards, and the, the CMB uh, photons uh, free stream to us, and the universe was then filled with uh, neutral hydrogen. And then the structure started to grow via gravitational instability, as, uh, 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 finally uh, big enough to form dark matter halos, and able to host the first baryonic object, basically then the, the, the birth of the first star was born here, and the radiation from the first star then reionized the, the neutral hydrogen surrounding it, and then the universe underwent the phase called uh, reionization around 500 mega years or so, um, and then the things, uh, the galaxy started to form and evolve and become the present-day universe that we see here today at 13.8 giga year, where we actually live in a accelerated uh, expansion. Uh, expanded a uh, universe driven by the, this unknown dark energy. I'm, I'm sorry, is there another pointer? Sorry. It's not. I, it's, it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, sorry for the interruption. So, uh, so despite this very remarkable and successful cosmological model, we still have many uh, unanswered questions, such as what's the property of dark energy? What's the property of dark matter that we don't know? And also this, uh, this area, the high redshift area uh, on the left here that we see today has basically remained unobserved. And is, it is actually unobservable by traditional light uh, from this period between the cosmic background, background and the, what, between when the first star lit up. So th this, this period is the, called the, the so-called uh, dark ages between a ratio of about uh, maybe 30 to 150 or so. Um, so 
basically, let me just quickly define what redshift is because we we I, we use it a lot in cosmology. So uh, as you know, because the universe is expanding, and th therefore the all the radiation or object will appears to be uh, moving away from us, and the radiation will be redshifted, and. And so, and therefore, the the further uh, uh, object is, well, further the radiation is, the higher the redshift. And we can basically very conveniently use redshift as an indicator for the distance uh, of the object, or because the uh, the speed of light is also finite. So this also allows us to use redshift to basically the radiation that we receive to date the universe. So the higher the redshift, the older the light co is coming from. So what uh, the period I'm going to talk about. I'll be talking about is uh, between redshift 30 and 150. So this is when the universe was just last, basically less than 100 million years old. And then uh, with 21 centimeter, uh, because these, it has a rest frame uh, wavelength of 21 centimeter or 1.4 gigahertz, the wavelength will actually be stretched when we observe it on Earth. And the, from this redshift, with the wavelength will be, we'll be thinking about maybe two meters, 10 meters, a very long wavelength uh, radiations, corresponding to a wavelength range of about 10 to 50 megahertz. So that's the uh, uh, frequency range I'm going to focus on today. So um, I'm gonna say that the, uh, the during the dark ages, there's essentially no other means to uh, trace the universe except for using 21 centimeter radiations when the period is basically filled with, when the area is basically filled with neutral hydrogen. So, and there are, uh, as mentioned, there are many different concepts going after to look for this signature. This is basically uh, essentially a, uh, a holy grail in cosmology. This is the last unexplored territory of cosmology that will provide a lot of information for us to understand the property of the, the universe. And then there are uh, several uh, different approaches, so including sparse array, single dish reflector that Hector just mentioned, and also there will be lunar uh, orbiters or constellations uh, uh, orbiting the, either the moon or at the uh, Earth-Moon L2, Lagrangian, uh, second Lagrangian point. point. So let me just get into what we actually want to measure. So uh, in observational cosmology, what we like to do is to use light, in this case, 21 centimeter, the brightness temperature, to trace the underlying matter distribution, such as these uh, three, sorry, these uh, pictures, uh, these, these maps here. So these maps are basically showing you the uh, distribution of matter, that matter in a computer simulation with one gigaparsec across in each uh, picture at several different epochs. So redshift 50 uh, down to uh, redshift one here. And so that corresponds to a very different observing frequency of 421 centimeter in the uh, megahertz range. So, um, so the, essentially the 20 centimeter uh, light will brightness temperature, or you can think of it as the flux density, well, the fluctuations of it will then allow us to map the distribution of the universe. And this, um, this distribution will allow us then to determine uh, the, uh, the property of, well, they will allow us to uh, basically understand the mass energy content of the universe, which then will, uh, because we can measure them through the growth of structure and through the geometry of the, the universe. And then we can then infer the property of the mass energy content, such as radiation, uh, dark matter, dark energy, et cetera. So uh, ideally, we would like to make a, a 21 centimeter map, such as the one on the right here, and we can see the fluctuation on very large scales, and we can hope to measure this as a function of redshift or at different epochs of the universe. So we have a three-dimensional three view of the universe, and then we can use that to infer many of the uh, properties of interest. However, this is uh, because 21 centimeter is a very weak line, and we are a very, um, we would like to see them from a very far distance. So these signatures are quite very difficult to, uh, to generate, actually. So what uh, we uh, currently hope to do is to measure the statistical properties of these maps. So instead of, sorry, instead of looking at these sub separate maps, we basically, basically just measure a, uh, shown here, a two-point function, or the pulse spectra of these, uh, these maps and the amplitude and the shape of this uh, pulse spectra, uh, the different curves here as a function of scale or inverse scale on the, as a x-axis will basically uh, tell us 
uh, de describe uh, describes most of the information of interest actually, and we can use that to infer cosmology. So, or alternatively, we can actually um, you, you can imagine you take uh, the sky map on the right. You can actually just average everything and just measure one number. And this is what people call the, the mean uh, temperature or the mean uh, amplitude of 21 centimeter at a given time of the universe or at a given redshift uh, of the universe. So then uh, this can be done uh, relatively easily. So you can basically measure this mean temperature as a function of frequency. And uh, in turn, you can actually map out the thermal history of the universe, which is shown on the left. So you can see a uh, redshift on, on the top uh, as a top of the x-axis or the frequency on the bottom of the x-axis. So what we are trying to measure is basically the, uh, what we uh, label the dark ages uh, signature there. We, we can the uh, the amplitude and the trough of this absorption feature will be a really great indicator for uh, our uh, a lot of cosmological understanding here. So um, so this uh, by doing this global average uh, signal, what we call the global average or the fluctuation signal, we can actually um, the advantage is that it's actually fairly easily uh, detectable in terms of sensitivity. Well, using an order one uh, single single radio dipole antenna, we can actually hope to measure uh, such uh, the, the global signature of 21 centimeter. However, this uh, the, this um, endeavor is more difficult when we move to the lower frequencies, so of order one or of order hundred or so. Uh, on the other hand, if we wanted to measure the fluctuation signal on the right, even if we just just statistical, it's actually uh, still pretty difficult to do, and then this require a kilometer. Um, area of a collecting area or larger in order to do this as a function of frequency. And again, it, this will be more difficult at low frequencies. So uh, just to show you that the um, both the um, fluctuation, the global signature and the fluctuations will have sensitivities to cosmology. Uh, for example, we can use uh, the shape and amplitude of these measurements trying to infer uh, the, uh, the inflationary physics. The, so we can understand the non-Gaussianality of the initial density fluctuations and try to understand the energy scale of inflation, for example, that's, which is very exciting for us. And then uh, we can use that to uh, understand the mass of neutrinos with radiation or the properties of dark matter or dark energy, etc. Um, so, but then this is still a very difficult challenge, uh, as you may know that he, well, we are basically astrophysical foreground limited. So, uh, for example, what I'm showing here is our own galaxy in, in the radio, which is dominated by the synchrotron radiation and has a spectral index of uh, frequency to the minus 2.6. So, which means uh, if we are interested in the very low frequency, for example, at 30 gigahertz, the galaxy is uh, shining really bright at 26,000, about 30,000 uh, 30, uh, Kelvin or so, while the signature of uh, interest 21 centimeters of order about 10 to 100 millikelvin. So there's a very large order of magnitude of uh, obstacle to get, get through here, uh, to get to the sing, sing, uh, signal of interest. And uh, additionally, as uh, Hector already noted, that the man uh, radio interference is actually a big issue for us, especially at low frequencies. And as you know, the radio transmission uh, is uh, affected by the ionosphere, and it actually completely blocks out the uh, radio transmission at uh, uh, below, uh, below about 30 megahertz or so. So all this calls for uh, mix at moon or uh, specifically the far side of the moon where we are sheltered from the Earth's noise, an ideal place for exploring this 21 centimeter signature. Okay, so I'm going to show you basically two examples that has been studied, uh, commissioned both uh, re related to, to NASA uh, about uh, exploring this 21 centimeter uh, signal from the dark side, of, uh, from the far side of the moon. So there are two approaches, as you remember. So uh, typically people, one could go for either a single dish or a uh, interferometer uh, array, uh, dipole array as approach. So the first, first one is called far side. This is a probe study commissioned by NASA in about 2018 or 19 or so to study the feasibility of about a billion dollar class missions. So far side was chosen as one of them. Um, so what you see here is a blue moon lander on the left. 
and with the rover, uh, the four rovers, the concept is that the rovers will basically deploy the, um, the antenna array. So, sorry. Uh, yeah, so the, the far side, the PI is Jeff Burns uh, from Colorado and with the JPO as the study center. And so this is another view of this uh, uh, Blue Moon Lander. And so this is the uh, intended uh, far side configuration. So far side will actually go from uh, 100 kilohertz to 40 megahertz with two uh, frequency bands, so low frequency below one megahertz and high fre frequency and above one megahertz. And then they, uh, they, it's based on, it's a radio interferometer with four, the configuration is four pedals, and then it, the, with a diameter of 10 kilometers or so. And there are 128 dual polarization uh, dipoles, and the, there are four rovers deploying this, um, uh, deploying these pedals. So you can see the, um, the, the, this tether line is actually served as part of the antenna. Uh, dipole and with the so the low frequency dipole will be embedded sorry embedded in the uh, in the tether it's about 50 meters long and then in orthogonal uh, mode there will be a high frequency mode uh, uh, sorry I couldn't point so apologize high, high frequency uh, dipole extending about 2.5 meters you can see in the figure here um, so there are uh, the the uh, the theater will basically serve also as for power and communication, and send the message back to the um, the core, the center of the core, which is lander serve as a core station or the base station. It will do will do the correlation, and then it will also provide the power and telecommunication with the gate lunar gateway for to transmit the data back. Um, so. Actually, if I have time, I'll just quickly show you this uh, this uh, movie. So this is actually an older version of the lander and the the rover, but uh, the concept is the same. So the rover will deploy the tether, dragging the tether line along with it, and they'll walk on the surface of the moon. So this is the the tether, and uh, and while it worked, it would basically deploy the antenna node here. So again, the the high frequency, um, sorry, the low frequency antenna will, is already embedded in the tether, and then the this uh, st stasis uh, injection will stasis mechanism will inject will deploy the short uh, the high frequency uh, dipole antenna. Uh, so I think I already talk about most of this. So I just skip to this uh, the other concept, which is the lunar crater radio telescope. Con uh, Study is a NIAC uh, phase two. It just underwent the uh, NASA NIAC phase two study, and the PI is Saptashi, uh, also based at JPO. So you can see it's basically uh, a receiver on the moon, on the far side of the moon, using the crater to uh, to build, uh, construct this uh, the L LCRT telescope. And then Jolajo, our next speak well, following speaker there, he's actually involved in the study. So please also talk to him uh, about this. So you can see it's very impressively, um, this is, the crater is about 1.3 kilometers, and the, this antenna reflector, uh, uh, this reflector is about 350 meter, and then the, the uh, no periodic dipole is actually suspended uh, in the middle, if you can see. So again, I'll show a deployment uh, movie. This is actually pretty impressive. Sorry, hopefully it runs. Yeah, so you can see the lander will land in the center of the crater, and then it will inject uh, the anchors <laughs> to the rim. Uh, should work pretty well. Uh, <laughs> just success here. And then it will uh, tense up, of course, and then uh, lift up the, the, the dipole antenna sorry, the uh, low periodic antenna in the middle. And then impressively, then the, uh, the reflector will deploy like origami style. You can see this is uh, based on heritage of the star shade uh, study, as you know, is another probe study for exoplanet uh, searches. And then the, there will be a, a beacon flying by for uh, data collection and transmission, uh, communication, et cetera. So uh, this is a uh, yeah this is a pretty very interesting and impressive uh, study uh, done by the LCRT team, 
And then, so both the OCRT and Farsight are basically considered the pathfinder of 21 centimeter cosmology from the far side of the moon. So they are both, uh, as a first step, looking for this global uh, dark ages signal, as I mentioned earlier, will basically be looking at the uh, sky average signal as a function of frequency in, in the low frequency. And the cost is roughly about $1 billion or so. And But there are also more ambitious um, concepts going forward, uh, such as the one called far view. This will be have about of an order 100,000 uh, dipole rate, and it will be doing in situ uh, resources uh, utilization. Basically, it will build the array on the moon itself using the moon uh, rigorous uh, to produce the material. And then this is occurring on the study. So this may, might allow us to start to think about measuring the fluctuation of 20 centimeter that will encodes a lot more information about the cosmology of interests. Uh, but these are all still pretty ambitious and uh, future concept, but uh, they are, they are nonetheless very exciting. So just to summarize, I hope I uh, mentioned that 20 centimeter is something, uh, 20 centimeter cosmology is something that uh, that we are all very excited about. However, there's still significant uh, instrumental and observational uh, obstacles that we need to overcome. But the potential uh, for the exploration and for synergies with techno signature searches are great. And uh, we look forward to future uh, development here. Okay, thank you. <laughs>